Hello, my name is Sylvia Pierce, and this is the 11th lesson in our series, Romans 5 through 8. Um, I hope you're following with us, and we really feel like this is going to be a great series. Uh, hopefully, you can do some home groups with this series. We hope you do. So, now I'm in the great, greatest victory chapter in the whole Bible, and that's Romans 8. It's where everybody wants to be, where everybody already is. But yet, uh, because Christ is already our victory. Christ is already the victorious, liberated one that lives inside of us. It's just that we haven't been living from that reality as long as we're living in Romans 7. So that, that's the problem. It's not that we're not already there, but hello, it's where we walk. That's why Romans 8 does put a lot of emphasis on, on walking. Walking in the spirit, walking in the flesh. So... Uh, and I've been reading from my little booklet, um, Romans 7, What's Wrong With Me? And now we're finding out that it was a lie. There never, never was anything wrong with me. It's just that Satan had deceived me and made me think I should not ought to try hard because basically I thought, thought of myself as separate from Christ. I'm going to hold up a chart just to do a little um, backtracking on what I said, not to stay there very long because I want to move right into Romans 8. But I want to, I want you to see this chart because basically what I have on there is Christ with a little eye in the center and that really is the truth about us. John 14 20 says in that day that I'm in the Father, the Father's in me and I am in them. So, so union, the union truth that Jesus preached to his disciples is the truth to the body of Christ, the same truth. So that's the real truth about us, that we are in him and he is in us. We were in him 2,000 years ago at the cross. We are in him present tense, in uh, even risen with him and seated in the heavenlies with him. He also is in us and the... Uh, the completed Godhead is right inside of us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, and we're made complete in Him. Colossians says that. So we're in Him. He is in us. And that's the great news of the Gospel. If you're not hearing that Christ is in you and you're in Him, maybe you're not hearing the fullness of the Gospel. But that that's what Jesus said and that's what Jesus prayed in John 17. That was his last prayer before he went to his father, that we might know that we're one, that we are one. Even his, he is in the father and the father is in him and they are in us. So that's the truth of the gospel. So that's the truth. But yet if we're not operating and living, living and functioning from that truth, we're, this is how we're functioning. Christ plus Christ in me plus a great big me. Um, I know, um, woman that um, went to her minister and her minister said oh oh you know Christ, I know that Christ is in me and she says oh pastor I'm not just saying that he's in me he is my very life so that's actually what being in him really means we're united with him so basically most people what most people think is yes he's in me but we put a big plus or a big but behind Christ being in me and then I say this is now but this is what I'm responsible for I have to live the life I have to do this I have to I I I I I and meaning that I've got a lot of shoulds and oughts that are still on me so it's a it's Christ in me plus a performing I well if we read in Galatians um, chapter 3 which i I'm going to read here. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that you should obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been constantly set before you, crucified among you, that only, this only I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, 
or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? And that's what Christ plus a big performing I is. Trying to perfect or make yourself complete in Christ, because that's what perfection is, by your flesh, by your own flesh efforts, by works. So basically, if you're operating Christ in you plus me and all that I have to do, uh, uh, then you're still operating from works. And recently, a good friend of mine who lives in California, Bill Byer, told me that this happened at one of the big churches out in California, that a minister came to a huge congregation and said, everybody in this congregation that's trying to live the Christian life, please raise your hand. And most everybody raised their hand thinking they were doing the right thing. And he says, I, I want to declare unto you that you're under witchcraft if you're still trying to live the Christian life yourself. And, of course, that shocked them. But basically, that's what this says. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath what? Bewitched you. So, if you're still living depending on a big performing eye, that that's still a form of witchcraft. I hate to tell you, but it is. So... That's what we're proclaiming here at Christ Our Life Ministries is that we no longer live, that that performing eye died with Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. And by faith, we can declare the fullness of the gospel, that we're whole, complete in him, lacking nothing, that he is my life. And you know, uh, when I began to declare that was that the most desperate time in my life, because many of you might say to yourself, how can that be true? How can I say that? I certainly don't appear that way. I certainly don't seem that way. And actually, I feel like I'm pretty much addicted and uh, addicted to relationships or maybe maybe even drug abuse or whatever it is um, in your life that makes you look at yourself and focus on your sins instead of on the one who lives in you. You see, maybe that's your condition. But you know what? I'd, I challenge you today to take a leap of faith and say, I don't understand how this can be true, but I'm going to declare what God says to be true about me. Because Colossians chapter uh, 2 says this, In Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is verse 9 of chapter 2. And... But, Verse 10 says, And ye are complete in him who is the head of principalities and powers. So all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ, and you are complete in him. Verse 11 says, In whom also we have, we, you are circumcised or sanctified. That's exactly the same thing. With the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So through the body death of Christ, uh, you, which is true circumcision, because it's putting off the body of sins. So you say to yourself, how can this be? Because I still, uh, there are still sins. I still feel addicted, addicted. I still feel crazy. But yet, God wants you to declare today what he says is true about you. And let him do the work of sanctifying you. Cause, because the Bible in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, said you were sanctified once and for all by the body death of Christ. So what Christ accomplished on the cross, you see, this is the fullness of the gospel that God wants you to obey the gospel today. Obedience means that I simply just agree with what God says is true about me. And you know, there will be a great fight of affliction because you're, because you've never functioned this way. You've never functioned totally by faith, surrendering to the one who is your life. And so it will be a, a, a warfare, but you let the Lord Jesus Christ do the fighting for you. Don't touch it. Don't try to do your own fightings. Don't try to deliver yourself. Stand by faith in what, in what, in the true, in the true uh, gospel that you already are delivered. I mean, that's that's a great and mighty thing. You are finally putting your faith in the truth instead of putting your faith in your own flesh deliverances. You you 
You have no power. The flesh has no power to deliver itself. But the one who lives in you is your deliverance. You stand true. And you take that leap of faith. And I say Romans 7 is really like the Jordan River. You know, we have uh, the example of the children of Israel. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, around and around and around and around. And they would not enter into the promised land. You know, it only was after 12 days they had the opportunity to enter into the promised land. But they shrunk back because they were afraid. And they were in more fear than they were in faith. Uh, the pro- uh, it, it should look like it should look risky to take a leap of faith it should look impossible because it is but you know what there's one in you that wants to leap into the truth and that's christ himself galatians 2 20 says we live by the faith of the son of god so you can't even use the fact that you don't have enough faith to believe it of course you don't you just take you just put your trust in the one who is your faith, who already has leaped into the promised land and has risen from the dead and is at the right hand of the Father, far above all your flesh reactions that tell you that this cannot be true because this is true. And God warns us in the book of Hebrews because he tells us in Hebrews chapter 3 because uh, the children of Israel were wandering in that wilderness and yet he, he says they had an evil heart of unbelief because they would not dare believe that it was total, that they were whole and complete and God was with them. Only Joshua and Caleb believed and they were the only ones that could enter into the promised land. Interesting statement in, in, in 2 Corinthians 5. It says flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Precious people of God, you have the kingdom of God within you, but you can be like the children of Israel and wander in your wilderness the rest of your life and not really enter in because you have an evil heart of unbelief. Or you can by faith. This is a possibility. It's already yours. Don't be like the children of Israel. You take your leap of faith and enter in to what God says is true about you and, 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 and say, I'm going to stand by faith that I'm whole, complete, lacking nothing. And you know, it says in the book of James, a lot of people, I remember when I was first learning the truths of grace, I almost wanted to cut the book of James out of my Bible until God showed me that James also was a union man. It's just we've misinterpreted the way he he gave he he gave union. The, I mean, only a union man could say this at the beginning of James. He says, "My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, and temptations and trials are the same thing, are equally the same thing, because trials are what have to." Adversity, the things that happen to you outwardly. Temptations are where Satan is, is accusing you inwardly. So James says, count it all joy. So this is really good for you when you're pounded away by Satan because he's telling you the opposite of who you are. And so it says, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience and let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect, entire, wanting nothing, you see, so this this peculiar time, this radical time, where you just stand by faith, when everything is poor, that outside of you is poured against you, and you say, no, let, let Satan come. I'm just going to count it all joy. I'm just going to say, thank you, Jesus. My little daughter, when she went through this time, Diane, she was... Uh, Go, she she really tried to commit suicide. This is kind of a radical time in our life, you know. And she um, tried to commit suicide. And she was recovering from that. And so she was bombarded with all these tormenting thoughts from Satan. You know, telling her how ta- terrible she was. And how she almost lost her children because she tried to commit suicide. And you know what? She was a housewife. And she would go to her kitchen sink and... Um, we in America have a, a dishwashing soap named Joy, and she would she the Lord would give her that little little metaphor where she would take that Joy bottle of Joy and look at her sink and look at the mess that was in her sink because her dishes were dirty, and she would say, "No, I'm not going to look at the mess," and that's just like not looking at uh, the torments in her mind. I'm gonna I'm gonna squirt a little Joy right in that sink. 
And I'm going to praise the Lord that the devil torments me because I, it causes me to stand by faith in who I really am. So I'm telling you, this is a beautiful and radical time. It's like a butterfly coming out, coming finally coming out of the cocoon that has enclosed his life, that is that is put him really in a place of death. The a cocoon actually is a is a tomb that the butterfly dies in because somebody told me that the butterfly actually melts to the place of liquid. It liquefies before it's transformed into uh, the, this new 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 created being, which is a butterfly. So this is the process of metaphors meta meta metamorphosis thank you david metamorphosis that that's taking place and it and you can't transform yourself that's that's the job of the holy spirit and by faith you can stand by faith that i already am a butterfly you you take it i don't care if you look like a caterpillar i don't care if you look like you're crawling around you stand by faith and say no god says i'm a butterfly i'm a brand new creation and um, I have a, another chart that I like to put up during this time, the, uh, during this uh, session when I teach this. It's called the leap of faith. I say that uh, people, the only way to get out of Romans 7 is to leap out just like a frog and jump into, what, into the arms of Jesus who tells you the truth and jump away from the devil's lies and the torment and say that and stand by faith that you have the mind of Christ. Um, even though it feels like your that your mind is tormented, uh, you take it that he he's the power that already releases you. But this chart is wonderful because it says, number one, it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform to the world or don't conform to what the world says. Romans 12, um, uh, two and three, and I and I have a wrong reference there. I see it's really Romans 12. 1 through 3, that's the reference that I should be put there in that place. Um, it says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that's just simply when the agonizing thoughts of, of, of what I've done and who I think I am comes, you just say, no, this isn't the truth. This is the truth. You turn from one to the other. That's what it means to turn the light on. You know, when you walk into a dark room, you don't fight the room. You don't fight Satan. You don't rebuke the darkness. You just simply turn the light on. Turning the light is turning from what Satan says about you to what God says about you. And that's renewing your mind to the truth. And um, this, the next point I have on this chart is, what do I believe? For by, the, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. That's Matthew 12. 37. So, um, it, it, it's, it's what we're going to say. I mean, God is birthing a son and a son lives by his, by his word of faith. He doesn't live by trying to fix or trying to improve himself or fight with flesh. He simply speaks just like Moses in the wilderness couldn't go into the promised land because he wanted to beat his rock instead of speaking to it. And, and which is the point of what a son does. A son just speaks to his hard place and declares the truth. And as he does it, the Holy Spirit brings the water that pours out of the rock that feeds other people. So your hard place is meant to be there because it's the very place that God is going to use and bring living water out to others. The only reason that I know this is because I've been in that hard place. I've been in the, it's like a pliers that just squeezes you into a place or a place of torment. I've been there. And all I could do, I could either believe the lie and die or speak the truth and live and uh, like the children of Israel this reminds me of the children of Israel in uh, the wilderness when the snakes came and started biting them well they were dying like flies so they went to Moses 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 the snakes are the venomous snakes are biting us and we're dying and so he said they said what shall we do and so Moses went to the Lord and the Lord said, put a brazen serpent on a pole and lift up the pole. And if the children of Israel will only look up, they will live. If they look down at their circumstance and the bite of the snake, they will die. 
And so many of them died because they refused to look up. So simple. Faith is so simple. It's not hard. It's just looking unto Jesus who who has accomplished all that that needs to be accomplished on the cross. Looking unto him. What's the brazen serpent? Well, that's a picture of judged uh, uh, Satan because Satan certainly is called the old serpent. serpent and um, brazen means brass and that's really the uh, um, the uh, metaphor of uh, of judgment. So Satan was judged on the cross in Christ, so that you're absolutely free. You have no rights, or, or uh, Satan has no rights to you anymore. He will only have rights to what you give him. So he has no rights legally, and you can say that to him. You have no more jurisdiction over me. Because I've been set free by the cross of Christ. You know, you know these um, movies that we used to see years ago when Dracula would come and the werewolves would come and people and the priest would hold up the cross. Well, there was some little truth to that, because the tro- cross is what sets us free. So that's why w- we all have a smile on our face these days, and we have for years now in Christ Our Life Ministries, because what we took by faith has taken us. And that's the beauty of faith, is what you take, takes you, and comes back inside of you as a living reality. And I declare, that happened to me 30, about 35 years ago. So, 35 years ago, I took the leap of faith and leaped into the promised land of who I really am in Christ. And it has been a living reality ever since. That, that's a, still amazing to me. And it's still wonderful. My friend Bill Bauer calls me occasionally and will just say, isn't it wonderful? Isn't it still great news who we really are? That it's not me living, it's really Jesus living. So when I, whatever I do, it's really Him living. And uh, if I come, if I'm on TV, it's really Jesus expressing Himself through me. Uh, if I go to the grocery store, it's real, really Jesus going to the grocery. If I hug my uh, uh, my family, it's really Jesus. Uh, and then people say, "Now wait a minute, you can't say whatever you do is really Jesus." And I'm saying, and I would say back, "Now you know, wait a minute, I might be tempted and slip and uh, walk in my flesh. I mean that that will always be there. The possibility is always there." Uh, the probability is not because I'm walking in the truth. I'm walking by faith. So even if I do slip, I just say, oh, that's not who I am. I'm back to who I am because Christ is my life. So it's a quick down, quick up. I don't spend time in misery. Oh my gosh, I've done it again. I always say to the Lord, I will do it again. So uh, you better get on keeping me. And that reminds me of Brian Coatney's Keeper's Creed, which one is when one of the greatest truths uh, that that he's ever said. I think it, it's just wonderful what he says. He says to the Lord, Lord, I will commit any sin left up to myself. Oh, what, wait a minute. I'm not left up to myself. I don't live here any longer. I'm not at home any longer by myself. It's Jesus living, uh, united himself to me and with me. Oh, so I left to myself. I will commit any sin. And you can keep me, but it's not good enough to say he can. You will keep me. It's not good enough to say he will. I have to take a leap of faith and say, I'm saying you are keeping me. And I'm going to get on walking in that reality and in that truth. Whether I feel it or not. Whether my mind says it or my feeling says says it. But I want to tell you, as you say the truth, your mind and your feelings will line up. And a great peace will start reigning inside of you. People say, well, what is that peace? Peace really is the person of Christ himself. It's the fruit of the Spirit reigning in us. It's actually, peace is really cessation of war. So there's no more war. There's no more battle. Because the one in me has already gained the victory. So that's the victory of Romans 8. And I couldn't help it. I just had to take off this morning and preach preach some truths to you. So let's begin 8 again. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Walking after the flesh is simply believing in uh, my own sufficiencies, my own um, 
efforts, my own abilities, my own life. That's walking in the flesh. That's what was crucified with Christ. Walking in the Spirit is believing in the sufficiencies of Christ in me, the power of Christ in me, the one who is my life, my very life. For the law of spirit and life has set, made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Okay, I always think of the law of aviation overcoming the law of gravity. You know, when an airplane raises above the law of gravity, all, all he's doing is, is moving into a new law, the law of aviation, where, and, and of course somebody more clever than me would have to explain exactly how an airplane lifts, but I think actually the air pressure lifts the, the air, the wings of the airplane up in the air. So one law is overcoming another law. Well, what are, what does these laws in Romans 8 mean? It means a principle. The law of gravity is a principle. If I drop something, hello, it's gonna, it's gonna fall because the law of gravity. Okay, the law of spirit and life has set me free from the law of sin and death. So you're already free. Because what we could not do, because we were weak in the flesh, God, Jesus Christ did for us in the likeness of sinful flesh. Well, what is that? At the cross, he was in the likeness of sinful flesh. No, was he sinful flesh? No. But he took on that likeness so that he might die to it, so that we might be raised in newness of life, so that he could come inside of us, and we could, and he could fulfill righteousness and the law of righteousness within us as we walk in in him so i mean this is really the good news of the gospel this is the rest of the gospel that's hardly ever preached and hardly ever taught which it which i regrettably say but we're saying now the holy spirit is bringing it to the whole christian world so i praise the lord i praise the lord that the devil have no more power in God's people, but they would raise to the real truth of who we really are and know that they're resurrected with Christ, seated with Christ far above principalities and powers, and His Holy Spirit is now seated inside of us, and we, He is complete in the Trinity, and He, and we are also complete in Him. So praise the Lord if you have much tribulation, much temptation, much pressures that tell you the opposite because it will only cause you to stand by faith and say the truth that you are whole, complete, lacking nothing. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to continue next time in lesson number 12 and we're going to go on in the great victory chapter of, of Romans 8. So thank you for being with me. Goodbye. The more I try the more I fall I finally see the writing on the wall The problem lives in what I see A separate him outside A separate me In a desert land